Greetings, adventurers. This is Travis with Fool and Scholar Productions with a quick production update. You've probably noticed that we have indeed missed a release. Uh, the reason for this, we are in the process of releasing a heck of a lot of content on many feeds. For starters, we've been working really hard to put out Vast Horizon, a science fiction tale of survival, available however you listen to podcasts, and also The White Vault Imperial. We believe we have a solution to increase the speed of releases for Dark Dice to keep us on schedule. However, while we wait each month through those grueling dark nights, we've created a Facebook group called The Reckless Play Guild. You'll recognize the administrators of this group as either voices from this show or some of our friends who make other shows that we love and collaborate with, like The End of Time and Other Bothers, The Lucky Die, and Dungeons and Dragons, truly great actual play podcasts. We created this group because we're all friends, we work together, we work on similar types of shows, and by working together we can have greater conversations with more like-minded people who love playing the greatest game ever made. So join us at the Reckless Play Guild to be a part of the conversation. Also, we would like to introduce you really quickly to one of our friends, the Dungeons & Dragons podcast. This is not an advertisement, these are actually people we genuinely love. I, I actually really get a kick out of their show, and we hope that you enjoy hearing the Maze Lord himself, Russ. Take it away, Russ. Well, hello there. I'm Russ Moore, your dungeon master from Dungeons and Dragons. We're a D&D 5th edition actual play podcast, and we're four friends who just love Dungeons and Dragons. Adventure, collaborative storytelling, laughing, and just hanging out with friends. Throughout season one, we play through the adventure module Rise of Tiamat from start to finish, with some extra flavor thrown in the middle. Season two begins with new characters, new stories, and a whole lot more laughs. We're Dungeons and Dragons, and we hope you can join us every Wednesday for a new episode at dumbdragons.com and subscribe on your podcast app of choice. Until then, have a great week, and we'll talk soon. Shelly Stipes, Salis. Do you seek him? You have found yourself among those who roll the dark dice. What you are about to hear happened long ago, a story brought back from the edge of oblivion, dutifully transcribed and enhanced orally to better captivate your attention. Previously, the team set off for Milliter's Hope to find the town's missing children. Instead, they found themselves prey to intellect devourers in the bodies of humans. Having discovered the true intent of the servants of the Nameless God, they set off in pursuit. Will the team's resolve hold up? Will odds roll in their favor? Fear the strangers in your midst. Never play games of fate. Dark Dice, Chapter 5, First Watch. As the combat concluded, the world-weary adventurers were forced to test their endurance and constitution against fatigue at disadvantage. However, the team found themselves able to carry on uninhibited, all that is, except for Father Westpike, whose old age and limp did not agree with the journey. Exhausted after the long night of travel, he could feel his old bones creaking even as he cast a healing spell on Rowena, helping the vile ailment pass over the next few minutes. Oh, thanks for help, because... <coughs> Look, you look tired. Am I stressing you out? Mm, All right. Well, I guess you can all clearly see the passage of time on my face. Uh, Father West Pike's body kind of stoops a lot more now, and the limp that he has, the he usually really tries to hide it, is becoming very pronounced now that the fatigue is setting in. The bear trap probably didn't help. Please say it was on the other leg. (laughs) <laughs> I'd have a double limp. It's it's not a limp if like you just have to take your steps just further apart than normal. <laughs> it's just a slower gait. Speaking of gates, Rowena. Okay, this is going to be a good sign. Go on. While coming to her senses, Rowena looked down at her body as she put her shirt back on and noted that some of the veins on her arms were more pronounced than she previously remembered. Deep blue arteries beneath paling skin. As she smiled falsely at Father Westpike, putting her glimmering sword away and taking a step back to dust herself off, she thought she could detect a faint whisper 
Oh, hell After yeah. After a few moments, Rowena decided that the whisper was not a sense coming from her ears, but a sensation of resonation within her very mind. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give him a listen. Why not? What's the worst that could happen? By centering herself, she began to more clearly detect faint traces of thoughts becoming louder and louder until she could finally hear a powerful voice breaking the silence. Who dares disturb my slumber? Um, me? Thou art a dwarf. Uh, yep, yeah, I'm a dwarf. Strong and true. Uh, what the fuck are you? The ages have been unkind. I am Shaliosi Thysrael, Bane of the Nameless. Oh, you're my sword. I am that which you hold, but belong to no mortal. I look down at the sword. Uh, are you the reason my arms are looking a bit weird? That is not my doing. I suspect it to be the corrupting influence of the Silent One's relic. Ah, right. Right, yeah. Hmm. Do you seek my aid? Yeah, I mean, if it's a way to take evil down, why the hell not? As Rowena is now talking to herself in Elven, I'm slowly creeping towards Rowena, holding her... I, I think she had a coat over her sword? And I'm gonna, like, put it over the sword and try to take it out of her hands. No, 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 no. Look, look, look. I think I'm onto something, Cos. Just give me a moment. Yeah, we're looking to hurt the Nameless God. Some cultists kidnapped children from our village and we're trying to rescue them before they're... Well, before something bad happens to them. I'm just talking to my sword. Don't worry about it. It's no biggie. I liked her better when she just played music. Then you must seek the gate known as Etya Kadeere, just up ahead. Once the children pass beneath its shadow, time shall pass differently, and they shall be lost forever. I'm pulling on the sword a little bit harder now. Like, I, I, come, I, come I on. put my hand against his forehead, because he's a little <laughs> bit shorter than I am. No, 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 wait a minute. Um, I'm looking for a gate. Um, you said that time moves differently beyond the gate, like slower or faster? It moves faster for those who pass beyond. Oh, right. That's, that's, that's good news for the little ones. Uh, what am I looking for in particular? A light up ahead. Just got to follow a light? Yes. Simply seal the old gate with blood so that the nameless evil cannot be released. This you must do for the sake of the world, no matter the cost. Is this light going to be there like right now or in a little bit? Because uh, no offense to my cousin here, but uh, he's kind of a little bit knackered and old. Don't talk about me to the sword. Please don't. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm feeling really knackered and old and tired and I might need a sleep. I just wink at my cousin like over the top. Uh, Do we have to go right now or? You may take time to lick your wounds, but tarry not for too long. That time could be crucial to All right. Cool. Uh, Would you stop talking to me if I let go of you? I would. Awesome. I dropped the sword. (laughs) Then I turned to look back at everyone else. (laughs) The shining blade clattered harmlessly to the ground. (laughs) Follow us, Pike. Like, like, scoot sit a little bit away from her with his feet. Like, okay. Right, that's a sword uh, called Bane of the Nameless One. I don't know if I told you when I threw it up at you. You should have used the sword. It's really cool. Uh, Yeah, um, it said it's... it's, uh, If I'm looking for the Bane of the Name... The Silent One? Nameless One? Uh, Bane of the Nameless. um, Looking for... uh, a gate a bit further on should be marked by a bit of a light. Good news, though. He said, it said that uh, time moves slowly, but differently on the other side. So we've got time. Good. We need to rest up. Well, you need to rest up, not punch my cousin on the shoulder. <laughs> Ex- yeah, we need to rest up. What do we do? I want some sleep. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I've got virtually no magic left. I'll take first watch. We're still in the middle of a graveyard, and the crunching sounds coming from the grave a mere seven feet away from us won't make for a pleasant lullaby. Let's go somewhere else to rest. The ground is also still bleeding. Oh, God. Uh, um, There was a second house we hadn't yet uh, excavated. Uh, How about we go check it out now? Away away from the mimic. That's a really good idea. Mm. Um... I'm going to pick my shirt back up and kind of put it back under my arm and just like mm. feel about a bit and then I'm going to pick up my sword. Illuminated by the flaming sword in the hands of Filgia the witch, Rowena picked up the sword carefully and affixed it to her hip. I have to say, Lady of Bunnies, that is the greatest sword I've ever seen. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Is it natural really, for you? Really, really useful. <laughs> is it natural for you to conjure up weapons? Uh, what? Does anyone think we ought to kill this mimic? Because we know that actually came out of the grave before. Oh, right, yeah. Does anyone got any arrows yeah. or... Oil? I think we definitely should leave it alone. As if on cue, the mimic, now in the form of a bloated and battered wooden chest with prehensile tendrils, carefully clawed its way up from the grave and began to slink away from the group. 
Just to clarify to the audience once more that the characters actually write these descriptions as I narrate them. I think it ate enough for today. I am assuming. A 15 yeah. and a 6. 15 as well with my crossbow. Oh, damn, son. <laughs> Meanwhile, Father Westpike is trying to usher those who do not have ranged weapons out of the graveyard, looking scornfully at uh, Ayas and Sorin. The first arrow from Sorin pierced one of the mimic's legs, crippling it as a bolt from Ayas's crossbow connected with a small glass vial hanging from the creature's teeth. In a remarkable display of fire and blood, the mimic spontaneously exploded spewing goo everywhere, as well as the partially digested remains of the hairless creature, which spread across the ground in a gory soup. Uh, the, the look of scorn turns into a look of awe as the mimic explodes. Like, oh, well done. Uh, mimics are not creatures that we want around. That was surprisingly effective. Well, I hope to see this display of skills uh, in comp- combats in the future. Soren is wearing much the same look and just sort of subtly puts his bow away. Father Sindri Westpike led the team to the other building, which lie in shambled ruination. As he wiped a thick grime from the window, he saw into the room beyond, a single chamber encrusted with black and red gelatinous goo. Chunks of what looked like flesh and globulous paste or blood seemed to have exploded outward from a central point within the room among the shards of broken glass that glittered on the floor. Along the edges of the red walls were leathery bits stuck in bundles to hairy strands, Perhaps bloodied hair or bile-covered sinew. Something clearly happened here. Right. I'm going to sleep in the grave. Father Raspike looks pleadingly at the group and then looks towards the inn. Was there anything Uh, wrong with the inn other than the smell of it? You wanted to go in the place that smelt like it was filled with death. Because we do have that potion of clear air or whatever it is. How long does it last? It lasts as long as we need it to. And it's more than enough for everyone! It lasts for about seven hours, so as long as, well, as long as we don't mind getting up a little bit early, you should be fine. Ah, that's the thing, you see, I... I I vote no, but I will just follow everybody else, because I'm not going to camp by myself. <laughs> um, so are we only worried about not staying in that place behind us because it looks like someone exploded? That's why I'm worried about staying in it, yes. I'm assuming... But sticky goo covers everything in there. And I bet it's a nightmare to get off your clothing. Um, because any anyone who's like a novice magic user should be able to clean that. I mean, I can. It'll take a while. I can do it. Does that disperse evil and good? <laughs> or perhaps rappled stains? <laughs> The Stain Devils! <laughs> no, it's a uh, it's little spell called Predetestation. Okay, I don't know that. It's a spell that basically allows you to clean a foot or something at a time. I mean, I could give it a good go. Let me just get this straight. We got that shack which can have, well, which can house two of us. Yep. And we got the other house that had something in a cart. Bodies. Bunch of corpses, yeah. Have we checked... You remember the cart. The, those things weren't the things that attacked us earlier? No. <laughs> now you say it like that, it seems like a really smart idea. Well, well, if they're in a cart, we could just push them out, right? Yeah, you would have thought. I guess so. I mean, I'm not going to do it because it's oh, gross, but sure. Yeah, and we got an open grave with nothing in it. We can shove them in there. And we can push the cart over it so it acts like a lid. <laughs> so I say we go back to that building there. I'm not going in the inn. It has like five pages of descriptions. Oh, it seems like a plan. Yeah, let's do it. go into that place because... What's his name? Cave? Cove? Dave? Cole. Cole. Right. Cool. Cole, Cole. Cole said we should go in there and he sawed it off, so I'd rather not go anywhere. He tells us to go. Maybe he's just at the end. Maybe he's waiting for us. Yeah, he's got the honeymoon suite ready. I don't believe what I just said. I'm just trying to be optimistic. <laughs> right. Let's go back to that building then. All right, if you need somebody to push a wheelbarrow full of dead bodies, let's go do this. Oh, God. Ias led the team to the structure with the corpse cart. The smell got worse as the team got closer. But having faced greater foes mere minutes prior, Sister Caverns fall, Ias, and Father... Uh, no, actually, Father Westpike was a little bit tired. And Father Westpike would try to help even if he's tired. No, no, I'm going to tell him not to. It's like, no, 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 look, you're, you're tired. Let, let them do it. You've done more than enough. No. And not, not to be rude to the dead bodies, but I am going to poke them before I start trying to move the thing they're laying on. Because I don't need them getting up and trying to stop me from moving their cart. <laughs> I'll assist. Let's do this. Like I said, just let them do it. Moving the cart would be more of an ordeal than anticipated. Between the mud, a mal-lined wheel, and various roots that just seemed to hide beneath the mud. 
As they neared the edge of the graveyard, one of the wheels broke entirely, forcing the team to push and drag the cart the rest of the way through the mire. They eventually reached the edge of the intended grave, and carefully deposited the corpses into the hole, practically filling it. The team had one final challenge in flipping the cart on top of the grave, but fortunately avoided fatiguing themselves in the process. Well, I'm also thinking that I've got 50 foot of rope, so I'm going to use that rope to tie around a nice ring as big as I can, trip wire around said grave in case anything goes wrong. With incredible care and skill, Ayas crafted a very intricate perimeter around the main grave, while using stones, shrubs, and scraps of cloth and mud to conceal it. The rope ended up around shin level for a dwarf, around hip level for a human. Excellent. Oh, and I've got a bell as well, so I'll just put that on here just in case. Well, the bodies in the ground and the perimeter set up, the team again found themselves inside the empty abode, the stench of decay partly abated by the missing sections of wall. From inside, they noted that they had cover from the rain, and that the ground underfoot was solid and dry. Yeah, uh, she's just, she's not taking any of this crap. She's like, no, 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 don't worry about it. I mean, yes, you're getting old, and yes, you're a miserable old bag right now, but don't worry about it. I mean, you know, you've had your time. No, okay, I shouldn't say that. Um, you mean, you've done more than I enough can, time. I can... I can undress myself, pl- lady. Yeah, no, sure, sure it can, but I'm just giving you, there's no no point, you know, uh, there's no harm in accepting help from people who, you know, care. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, uh, I don't think any less of you, just because, you know, you're struggling a little bit and, you know, your knees are cranking and old and you took a bear trap to the leg. Ah, the chain was getting caught in my beard. Please be careful. <laughs> What if you stop wiggling? <laughs> what if you stop pulling for a second, please? So while that's going on, who's going to be on watch with me? I will Alright. Everyone else, I'm assuming, was going to sleep? Hex, yeah. Sure, I can take next watch. How will we break up the watch? We should do it in Paris. Yeah, in Paris. So who's after us? Um, Soren and... <sighs> I will go if I must. Alright. And then I'm assuming Father Westpag and Rowena take the last... Yep. Or how are we doing this? How long does everybody have to rest? Oh... Yeah, yeah, eight hours is pretty... Eight hours, that's the rules, so it's four, four, four. Half a day of sitting in a disgusting shed. On first watch was Sister Cavern's Fall and Aya Sin's Keep. As the others prepared themselves for sleep, they consumed one day of trail rations, drank water, and took off their armor, so they could receive the full benefits of the rest. By the way, guys, if you hear the Shrieking Rock, wake up. Being given the easiest task of taking first watch... Both Ayas and Sister Cavern's Fall had no difficulty remaining awake and focused. At one point, I'm going to take out the little uh, mechanical bird that I have and start talking to him. So to clarify, generally looking out and being quiet and maybe talking to her mechanical bird for four hours? I don't know. Generally, just keeping watch is a good idea so that we don't get snuck up on. Um, I'm going to specifically be looking for two or three glowing eyes because you said previously that the thing lost an eye. Um, so maybe it only has two now. Well, it has sockets where it just puts the eyes, well, the eyeballs themselves. Yeah, so it could have just stolen another animal eye, because that's a total normal, th- normal thing to do. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be looking out for that, and I, I'm actually going to use up all of my divine senses while I'm doing this, because I can mm. get a better perception of any evil approaching, and I'm going to be resting soon anyways. Uh, divine sense... And as this happened, what did Ayas Inskeep find himself doing? I'm just going to be watching. I've nothing else. I've got no magical wonders to do. You don't have books of, like, poetry to read or anything? I could lend you my island of passion if you want. I'm going to go with a hard pass there, just listening for that distant tinkle. Oh, yeah, I guess I'm going to pray, because that's what I do. I'm like, <laughs> like an afterthought. Oh, that's that's <laughs> going to give Ayas something to pitch up. Shut up, you're asleep. You're asleep. This is my evil sonar. <laughs> Oh yeah, this place is evil. But yeah, I'm going to uh, pray to Ilmeter for to relieve the suffering of all of those that we just threw into the grave, and uh, to forgive me for causing suffering to others for all that stuff, because I'm going to probably be murdering some more people in the future. Yeah, that's cool. It's a silent prayer. That's why I'm not actually saying anything out loud. And then I pull out my bird, little Siggy. Ias watched in confusion as his companion pulled out a strange little creature, a canary of metal and bone inside of a gnomish-style caged lamp. As Sister Cavern's fall began to whisper to the small bird, Ayas became increasingly concerned for her sanity and for his own well-being. But he overcame these concerns. Siggy, Siggy, can you hear me? I thought I might be the one going insane here, but then I realized I'm not the one talking to an owl. <laughs> it's a canary! And his name is all Siggy. <laughs> you know what? 
After all, after what I've seen so far today, it's really nothing. So Siggy can give me information on evil things. Siggy, do you think everything's going okay? Am I going on the right path? Would you just work justly? What is danger, but it is all around you? What is your question specific? How much evil do you see in our path between us and the children? It cannot be seen, for it is not of this plane. They are not of this plane. They are beyond, in the world beyond. They are not dead. He's being all cryptic, so I'm just going to be like, go back to sleep. Great dangers. <laughs> oh, Put a little towel on top of his cage like you do for all birds <laughs> in a bit of a way. That's so adorable. It rasped as she put the hood over its cage. Unable to hear the whispering of old Siggy, Ayas found himself distracted by a different sound. The muted patter of feet running across the wet ground. As he looked off into the distance, he thought he could just barely make out a small dwarven child with thick dark hair running off in the distance. He couldn't be certain, but he briefly thought it might be his own missing son. Hey, sister, um, sister what's-her-face, uh, Rowena. It's Kevin's fault. Yeah, that's the one, yeah, Kevin's fault. I'm pretty sure I saw my son or one of the other missing kids run from the graves back the way we came. Towards the end? Yeah. All right. So, I know... I know you probably think that that might be your kid, but it's probably more likely it's a trap. You know, I... As as much as I love my child, my barren, age 12 dwarf who's really good-natured, I can't help thinking it probably is a trap. All right, so we're just going to stay here and protect the sleeping people. Yeah. But then again, you get to believe in your strange, silly things that probably aren't there. Why can't I believe in mine? Because my strange things that probably weren't there, were there before all this craziness started. But that running dwarf, dark shadow, child looking thing that just ran by, that's probably the shadow demon that keeps trying to take the forms of all these different bad guys to lure you and then stab you. Do you remember getting stabbed? Because you got stabbed. Maybe you're seeing things because you've lost so much blood. And we know it likes picking us off one by one, that's true. Could I at least just stick my head around the corner and shout for him? Stand right there and shout for him, maybe? Yeah, it's probably a bad idea. You said that he was a good-natured child. He is a very good-natured child. So does he usually go running at full speed across a yeah, muddy, bloody field? He probably doesn't expect his father to be right there, though, hiding in some abandoned shack. Well, then you shouldn't expect him to be running through a bloody field. Fair. There you go. Let's not get you murdered. Yet. So, what sort of stones do you suppose make up this chimney? (laughs) Oh, okay. Let me tell you. (sighs) A few hours passed. And that's how we use levels of lead poisoning to determine what generation the deceased inhabitants of the Apeloka Islands are. Ah, That actually reminds me of a story about one of the constellations the first navigators used to find the Apeloka Islands, but... Ah, maybe next watch, because it's time for the next group. Phlegia? Phlegia? Uh, 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 Phlegia? Uh, what? Yes? What? Oh, bunny lady of Zarketh, it's yours and Soren's watch. Ah, uh, sure, thanks. Oh, uh, by the way, guys, there's some spooky shadow children that might or might not be running around. Okay. Spooky shadow children. That doesn't sound good. And there's some Benny here that likes to talk to a, you know, an owl, canary thing. It's canary. Yeah, You're going to have well. to be more specific. That, that could be any of us. I like talking to animals. I understand that. Yeah, but it's not real, though. It's... Well, does it matter if it's real or not? If she likes talking to animals... She talked to a sword earlier, and everyone was like, oh, that's totally okay. As as she rolls over and pulls the sword a bit closer to her. Well, when uh, (laughs) Aias and Cavernsfall came to get Soren, he appeared to be sleeping upright against one of the walls with one of his eyes completely open, and he was spinning a uh, dagger in his hand, which appears to have created a small pool of blood from no discernible source on the floor. But all that's over now. Yeah, me talking to my bird's not the weirdest thing going on. With that, Sister Caverns Fall and Iasin's Keep unfurled their sleeping bags and set off to slumber, while Soren and Filgia move to take watch. I would like to see first if it's uh, structurally stable enough for me to get on the roof and just have a look around for any figures in the distance. Soren was able to confirm this with a mere cursory glance. The building appeared to be sturdy, despite the damage done to it over the last few decades. And I'm going to pull out my journal, because I'm going to write everything that we experienced today down. Because 
I like doing that. And I try to listen if I hear anything since my eyes are occupied. Keep my eyes open, you know. As Philgear wrote the date into the margin, she glanced up to notice Soren walk to the exterior wall and make a gesture to show his intent to climb. Uh, I mean, sure, why not? Do your thing, dude. Soren's climb required an athletics check. Absolutely. Uh, Twenty, looks like. Despite the rain soaking his footholds, Soren, the ever-experienced climber, was able to easily locate footholds thanks to the uneven nature of the building's construction. He reached the roof with minimal difficulty. However, with the stress of the day weighing on his conscience, he had to make a sanity check to see what his next actions might be. Absolutely. So eight. As Soren, completely in control of himself, reached the roof, Filgia, whose character flaw was that she's always prone to falling asleep and hated taking watch, required a constitution saving throw. Natural 20. <sighs> Despite her natural disposition towards slumber, she found journaling to be surprisingly exciting given the events of the past few days. She even did this with the ability to retain an awareness of her surroundings while Swan looked off into the mists below. The fog had gotten more heavy, and he thought he could make out swirling shapes just beyond vision. Visibility below was reduced to 40 feet and dropping, but beyond the swirling shadows that kept their distance from the building, he could not discern anything without a perception check. Hmm. Yeah, let me see if I can peer any deeper into the mist here. E 16 plus 5. Soren was suddenly able to discern three glowing orbs coming from a shifting shape within the fog. I'm debating calling out to Filgia, who are perhaps trying to shoot a fire arrow at the creature. I'm just going to stare at it so I don't lose track while slowly notching an arrow. As Soren stared into the face of the Silent One, it stared back, and he needed to make a charisma saving throw. Sure thing. It's like a 11. Soren's focus wavered as he started hearing a chanting whisper, soft at first, but growing in intensity with each passing moment. He began to notice a stench of decaying rot accompanying these whispers and the faint sound of buzzing. Then suddenly, he found himself down on the ground level, standing next to Filgia, who was facing away, reading her book. Only he found that his hand was gripping her scalp, and his knife was at her throat. Before he could react, a growing sea of crimson began to pool down her esophagus. Soren noted the knife, the sticky red dripping in his hands, the flecks of warm flesh clinging to his arms all the way past the elbow. It was at that moment that he noticed the cruel smile on his face, visible in the reflections of the knife. The spatter of blood present on his face, in his hair. The laughter grew from within Soren, but he recognized the voice to not be his own. Then he woke up and found that the <laughs> laughter was not coming from him, but from somewhere far off. Soren was no longer on the roof, but was now next to the graves deep within the mist. Unsure of his relation to the rest of the team, he found himself utterly alone. Oh boy. That is, until he saw swift motion to his left. Um, can I do a fetal position check? Is that- Soren took 20 stress damage from failing the earlier check, unsure if he murdered his teammate. But as he searched his hands for blood, he found none. Hey, hands are sort of shaking, and I'm gonna try to just shake it off and get them to stop, and immediately turn to my left and try to identify the figure that I feel or see. Soren's shaking ceased all at once, and as he turned, he found himself staring into a featureless face. Beyond the three gaping holes were severed eyes, glowing in a dull, magical crimson, reminiscent of Philgia's blood. I'd like to wave at it. It raised a hand in mimicry, waving back at Soren. I'd like to say, do you seek him, but not as a question, just as a statement. Soren could hear the words repeated back in his head in Infernal, though the creature lacked a mouth. I nod. The creature nodded with him. And I, I'm not sure what to do exactly. As Soren stared deeper into the sockets, they appeared to glow brighter, forcing Soren to make a wisdom saving throw. Sure thing. Is a 14. His vision began to swim as, somewhere far off into the mist, Filgia finished her journal entry from that night. And then we threw bodies in a grave and put a lid on top of it. Like a pot. Soren descended from the wall and looked back into the camp. Okay. I nodded at him as he passes by. Soren nodded, silently sat down in the corner and gazed outside, playing with his dagger. 
spinning it. Did you see anything, Soren? Soren shook his head. The mist is growing thicker. It's difficult to see. Okay. Everything's fine, though. We can continue our watch. Yes, I'm going to read Island of Passion. Keep an eye out there for me. Yeah, good choice. I hear that one's popular. Okay, I really was not expecting this many to fail at once. Sorry for what's about to happen, guys. Midway through the chapter about the chief's son, Soren stood up and walked past Filgia's view. Perception. Um, hold on. Yeah, I, I have a 22. Filgia was able to casually follow his motions with her eyes while she briefly feigned reading. Soren approached the sleeping form of Sister Cavern's fall, and for what seemed like three minutes, he stared at her. Standing right over her unconscious form, his face inched closer and closer until they were only a breath apart. He continued to study her for another minute, perhaps two, before moving on to the form of Father Westpike and repeating the same process. Then Rowena. And finally, Ias. Satisfied with whatever he was doing, Soren nodded to himself again with a smile and gave a casual wave to Filgia. At me? Weird. <laughs> I act like I'm still reading my book and I don't notice him. Satisfied that Filgia was not watching him, Soren turned back to Sister Cavern's fall and started stabbing her in the chest. <gasps> what? I instantly get up. Oh, fantastic. Roll for initiative. Wait, 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 wait. Initiative? What? Where? How? What? Shit. The twenty-sided dice. Sister Cavern's fall was stabbed in the chest multiple times with a knife for eleven damage. I just, I got a nat twenty on initiative. It doesn't matter because it's initiative. You just got awake instantly. Being stabbed in the chest will do that to you. <laughs> yeah, I'm awake. Sister Cavern's fall was enjoying a dream where she finished the Church of Ilmeter's Hope. Mayor Delvin Brighthope and the citizens of Ilmeter's Hope were all in attendance for its first ceremony, commemorating the one-year return of their children. As a surprise, the villagers had gotten together and were naming the church the Caverns Fall Church in honor of their hero. The children were dancing in the streets and... I have weird dreams. The children were dancing in the streets and throwing flowers into the air when suddenly, Sister Caverns Fall felt a shooting pain in her chest. As her eyes tore open and breathing became difficult, her mouth opened in shock when she saw Soren Arkwright standing over her with a dagger, <laughs> continuing a furious onslaught. <laughs> <laughs> Without armor to dull the attacks, the only thing keeping her from death was the bone that the blade had repeatedly caught with each wild cut. Elmer, give me strength to divine smite. I just woke up from a fantastic dream and I'm being stabbed by some human guy. It's not his fault. We're still asleep. For the love of God, can someone scream? Anyone. And that was a nat 20 on my smite. What? And smote he was. Sorry, but also not because you're stabbing me. 17 damage. Sister Cavern's fall reached out for her warhammer and swung it up in a blinding arc. Ha! With one of her lungs punctured, Sister Cavern's fall found it difficult to breathe, much less scream. <laughs> with a flash of light, knocked Soren back. Vision still swimming, adjusting to the blinding flash. Sister Cavern's fall thought she could see a faint ripple under his skin, and as it briefly turned black before readjusting back to its normal pale color, dagger poised, Soren was ready to strike again. I tackle him. Before he could recover and attack again, Filgia tackled Soren from behind, ha! knocking him to the ground with a loud thud that woke up the remaining party. Soren struggled, slashed out with a dagger, biting into Filgia's forearm. As their eyes locked, Filgia needed to make a wisdom saving throw. Twenty-two. Filgia's fierce gaze broke, but just as quickly as he attacked, Soren fled into the darkness and rain, pursued by Filgia. And back to the top of the round, Sister Cavern's false lungs burned fiercely. I could heal myself, or... Man, how long does it take to don armor? How many rounds? Yeah, about a hundred rounds, yeah. What rounds in this thing will take to escape? Sister Cavern's fall began to silently pray and lay hands upon herself, the red cord from her holy symbol spreading out across her chest like a network, sewing and melding her skin back together. As the cord finished sealing the last of her wounds, it slowly moved to wind itself back around the holy symbol of Ilmeter in her hands. <coughs> Her lungs healed, Sister Cavern's fall could breathe again, after expelling a few breaths of congealing dark liquids. Meanwhile, Filgia was pursuing her quarry deeper into the mist. I tried to stop him, maybe grab his arm or something, whatever to keep him from escaping. Filgia was able to slam into Sora, knocking him into the mud. As she began to move on top of him and began a flurry of punches, a flash of metal bit into her arm again, forcing her to relent. With a final hate-filled glare, Soren fled further into the fog. 
Ias, however, appeared next to Filgia moments later, crossbow in hand, and watched as, from his perspective, Soren seemed to chase after something unseen in the distance. Can I see the something he's after? Ias could not discern what Soren might be chasing. Soren, stop! Soren continued to run. That's not the Soren we know! Shoot him! And I pull out my crossbow? He tried to kill Cavern's Fall! That's not Fugia. She's a Doppler. He's the Doppler! At the last possible moment, Ias took the shot, which found its home in the back of Soren's leg. He could not see how much damage it inflicted as Soren vanished into the mist. That's a good shot. Thank you. What the bloody hell's going on? Soren, come back! Dark Dice, Chapter 5, First Watch. Starring Caitlin Statz as Sister Savarite Caverns Fall, Peter Lewis as Soren Arkwright, Ethor Vithyarsson as Sindri Westpike, David Alt as Ayas Inskeep, Kessie Rilinicki as Filgia the Witch, Hem Cleveland as Lady Rowena Granite Pike, and Travis Vengroff as Dungeon Master, featuring guest voice Palmea as the Sword, and transcriptions by Hem Cleveland. This episode was co-edited by Sarah Baczynski and Travis Vengroff, with sound design primarily by Sarah Baczynski, and mixed and mastered by Sarah Baczynski. This is a Fool and Scholar production. Thank you for listening. <laughs>